morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Okay. It's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. This is my fourth visit to the Philippines, and every here I'm just uh, enjoying every minute. And not only the places I go, but the friendly people that I meet. And I thank you for coming today. Um, as Giselle, I'm an insect physiologist and a neurobiologist, and I'm interested in, in studies both from the point of view of their impact on, on our society and from the point of view of using them as model systems to understand uh, various aspects of physiological processes and in particular interested in how the nervous system makes behavior. So let me start with the first slide. So my, my, the theme of my talk is molting. Now, insects are a dominant life form on this planet, and human beings have become a dominant life form, not just because of our growing population, but because of the technologies that we develop. And so insects and humans uh, come together uh, aspects, and, and some of the aspects uh, are rather threatening for humans. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of the newest things um, to happen in the Philippines is dengue fever has come back. And uh, uh, insects, mosquitoes carry this disease, and we'd like to know uh, how we control disease vectors. We'd like to know how we can develop better ways to control insects that compete with us for food. And so, everything we do when we get out of our study of insects gets us a little bit further along, not only understanding how they work, but how we can manage their population, reduce the impacts of disease that they spread and food that they consume. So one of the main questions is, what are the vulnerabilities that we can identify in insects? Uh, insects have rather unique pharmacologies that go along with the kinds of signaling that goes on in their nervous system. And there are insect control strategies that focus on some of the unique aspects of their pharmacology. Neonicotinoid insecticides for example, for insects, even though they impinge on the acetylcholine receptor, which is a common feature of nervous system in insects, there are differences that these neonicotinoid insecticides focus on, allow for insect control and minimal impacts on non-target organisms. Pathologies also can be identified in, in looking at venomous uh, and parasitoids of insects, and as Giselle mentioned, some of my work has uh, been devoted to that area. But today I want to talk about another unique aspect of insect uh, biology, which is uh, the whole life process of insects because of their exoskeleton on molting. In order for them to develop from the immature to the, the winged reproductive adult, they have to go through many stages, and at the end of each stage, they have to recognize a series of behaviors that allows them to escape from their old cuticle. And they have to perform these behaviors at, at a critical time and in a critical behavioral sequence in order to complete this task. And if anything about this process is interrupted or, or disrupted, they get trapped in the exoskeleton and they die. So what I'm going to tell you about today is some work that I've been doing for the past 15 years with a number of collaborators. And the, the model organisms that I'm using to understand molting and uh, also what happens at the end of the molt, which is called, it's a Greek word that means to take off your coat. That's the ultimate sort of end point step of the molt where the insect actually performs behaviors and extricates itself from and not only is it shed the cuticle that surrounds it, but its lungs or tracheal system are lined with the cuticle, and the gut is lined with the cuticle. And this process has to be performed in such a way that all of these are pulled out in the right way at the right time to be successful. So we've been looking at moss, two species of moss mainly, uh, the tobacco hornworm and the sexta, and the silver hornworm. And also, we've been looking at fruit fly, Drosophila, because of the tools that are available to uh, 
test hypotheses that come uh, with moths and other insects. stages from the A to the adult, and here you see a, a cover picture from Science Magazine back in 2002, and the, the larva hatches from the A and goes to three larvae stages, the pointer's not too great. So at the end of each of these larval stages, the animal has to shed go from the first instar larva to the second, from the second to the third. Then the animal pupates, and the ecdysis behavior sequence at this stage. And then finally, at the end of the pupa stage, the wing reproduction uh, emerges to a specialized ecdysis called eclosion, and the adult is here. So we've been interested in, in the physiological processes that allow this process from egg to adult. And here I have a, this is a cicada undergoing that last dysis we call eclosion. Rolls out of a, a nest, the mother goose rolls it back. 
uh, or the neck uh, rocking behavior that's repetitive. The way during this behavior she continues to roll the fan away the neck. But once it started, it goes on to that three uh, stimuli. And this is a behavior in a fiddler crowd. And here's a human. Lots of innate behaviors. And here's an innate behavior that I hope doesn't happen during my talk today. But as you yawn, and if your friend yawns, you, you yawn because you've seen that. And it's something you have to learn. We know how to do this from birth. Okay, so back to the, the, the theme of this talk. So in the case of, of insect larvae, here you have a fourth star, a fifth instar larva pupil stage and then the adult. And at the end of each of these stages, you have this where the animal extricates itself from the cuticle. So the molt is defined by these blue shaded areas. And the molt is initiated by a surge of steroid called a dystroid, which causes a sequential waves of gene expression that allow uh, to, to separate from the old cuticle, synthesize a new cuticle, and finally shed that cuticle. And it's this, this end process, and this is under the control, as I said, of the dysteroids, and which uh, programmed the form of the animal after the mold. In this case, juvenile hormone, which has, isn't actually shown in this picture, is going to be high, and the common steroid in the, in the juvenile hormone, or JH, programs the animal to be another larva. When, when it undergoes ecdysis to go to the pupa, this steroid pulse occurs in the absence of GH. The animal changes into pupa. And, if, and during this stage, then, the animal metamorphoses into the adult. And I'm going to focus on this last step in, in the mold, ecdysis, and talk about what we've learned over the past number of years about how this process works. In, in taking this understanding to another level was uh, the realization that what you see here now is an isolated part of the central nervous system in black. And these, these are the, the lungs with the tracheal tubes. They get out together with this isolated nervous system. And these electrodes here are recording motor side with, with ecdysis behavior. And these tubes here are the system to keep it inflated. The nervous system is highly aerobic and depends on oxygen function properly. This guy here, Dushan Zitnan, a, a Slovak, who, who postdoc with me for a while, uh, during his PhD in Czechoslovakia at the time, that our network of endocrine cells depicted as red dots here. He called them Inca cells. And he didn't know what these cells were doing until he came to Riverside and together we and identified some peptides, simple peptides that these cells would use. Once this peptide, which we call like dice triggering hormone, is released into the animal within a, a couple minutes, starts doing this innate behavior, this ecdysis behavior, is composed of several sequential behaviors. So this is a kind of a that initiates and schedules the behavior that the insect has to go through to shed the cuticle. You see one of these Inca cells in a photomicrograph micrograph here that's been stained with an antibody for one of the peptides it makes. And it's sitting on the surface of this tracheal tube facing the blood space. And this is the whole cuticle that's been separated at the initiation of the mold. And when that, the, the events during the mold are completed, the cell then releases almost all of its peptide content across the animal into the behavioral sequence that allows it to undergo a dysis. Here. This is what 
it was done normally, man, was in the mod wire, we just watch it. The blue here is a pre dice behavior. The yellow is a second uh, motor program that, that starts about 20 minutes. The first one starts, and they're performed together. And after 60 minutes, the animal switches to a third behavior and falls out of the cuticle. And we found that the peptides in these thinker cells into an animal before this normally occurs will play out one or more of these behaviors. This peptide initiates just the first step, and then the animal doesn't know what to do next. The second peptide, when injected into the animal, starts off this yellow behavior and then followed by the red dice behavior. And here you see these three behaviors and the muscle groups that are involved. And these are, these are rather simple behaviors. Here you see uh, one muscle, dorsal ventral muscles we call them. And you can actually record the motor verse that coincided that with the isolated CNS after this first peptide. And the parameters of those motor verse are almost identical with the motor verse in the intact animal. Similarly, you see muscle groups the second pre two behavior, a different set of muscles, and each one of these behaviors can be recorded in the isolated nervous system. So that's one of the reasons we think that these behaviors are played out by central patterns without any need for sensory input to control them. And here's the peristaltic dysis behavior. Here are the linings of the lungs or tracheal tubes being pulled out as the cuticle is being pushed forward and sheds the cuticle, which exits from the rear. from the isolated CNS. Now these Inca cells and the peptides are occur throughout the insects. Here you see these, these staining cockroaches, mosquitoes, crickets, crane flies. Fire here in forest, and here's Drosophila. So this seems to be a physiological process in insects. Now, in some part, about 10 years ago, moved the project uh, into the soft. Here's the fly larva with the Inca cell shown on these tracheal tubes. Here's the adult. Interesting, these cells persist in the adult. We're trying to understand. What they do in the adults, there's no more once they become adults. Here's a, a stained cell here. A cell in a fly line that we made that fluoresces. And part describes the sequential events uh, in flies that occur when this ETH peptide is released into the hemolymph, shown here in the red. In addition to pre diasis behaviors shown here and shown here, we discovered that the release of these peptides also allows the animal to inflate its lungs, which are filled with fluid right before it dies. And what you're going to see if you look here are bubbles forming from within the animal and passing anteriorly. Now it's going to go posteriorly. These are the main tracheal trunks in the larva. Peptide initiates this inflation process that allows the insect to breathe again uh, before it starts uh, the ecdysis process. It's in some ways very analogous to a newborn baby which has a lot of fluid in the lungs and, and uh, lungs of this fluid rather quickly once, once it's born or emerges from the Okay, now one of the key things about ecdysis is that it's a vital process. What Park did in Drosophila was he knocked out the hormone, the gene that uh, hormone. And natural ecdysis, again, I showed you in the previous, uh, this peptide is released into the blood and it's followed by pre ecdysis and ecdysis behaviors. If encoding the peptide is 
knocked out in this fly line, the animal is missing these behaviors. It does some kind of dice-like contractions, but and the inflation process is delayed, and the animals get stuck in their cuticle and die. So we think one of the things that can occur in the future now, knowing more about how this process of antagonist for the receptor that this hormone targets, and if, if we can do that, we may have new insect control agents. And this, this knockout that can't do the behaviors or commercially cute can be rescued if, if the synthetic is injected here at this lightning bolt, the animal goes through all the behaviors and successfully ignites Now, another aspect of this is the animals acquire the behavior at the, at the, at, during the molt, and they lose the ability to perform the behavior at one time. And so the molt actually allows the animal to reacquire the behavior for use at the end of the subsequent stage. So it's an episodic behavior that is controlled with steroids. So you see here, the steroid surges during the fourth moth larva, and the, the transcript that encodes the hormone surges in <coughs> close uh, synchrony with the steroids. The steroids actually makes the hormone. We've also now identified networks of, of peptide in the CNS that are shown in these colors here, yellow and green, that express the receptor, the receptor in the moth. We call these peptidergic ensembles. We think the hormone of neurons, causing them to release their peptides that then turn on the central peptides for the behavior. So this uh, network of peptidic neurons targeted by this hormonal peptide EPH are also found in So these are the homologous groups of neurons in Drosophila, again indicating what a conservative process this is. And we know that the receptors also surge transcript surge shortly after the steroid surges to begin the mold. So one of the questions we wanted to know is, do receptor neurons that respond to the peptide become active at the right times? That is, when the peptide is released into the bloodstream or when it's applied artificially to the nervous system. So we, we can, in cell-specific fashion, drive the expression of indicators that calcium starts to oscillate in a cell once it's been activated. So we, we the behaviors the animal goes through with calcium dynamics in these ETA receptor cells during pre ectysis and post ectysis I don't know what Does anybody know how much time I have? Okay. I don't have to go so fast. Okay, so calcium imaging is a technique that we've been using in flies to control cell-specific drivers to, to see when these ETH receptor cells are active. So I want to show you, just give you a flavor for how this kind of experiment works. Do you see these ETH receptor neurons, these peptidergic ensembles, showing, in this case, a green, green fluorescent protein fluorescence? And you can, we're, we're Experiment I'm going to show you a movie of. We have two ensembles of neurons, the green ones and the brown ones. The green ones express a peptide called kinin, that's shown in, in various experiments, is involved in trait to inflation and pre behavior. Brown neurons here make a hormone called versicon, and versicon has long been known to be involved in cuticle sclerotization, hardening, and darkening. Also has functions as a behavioral peptide. So what we do is we can isolate the nervous system here. Now remember that the behaviors can be played out without any sensory input, and, and we've shown this in the moth and in the fly. Central pattern generators are turned on when the peptide is applied, and then we can visualize the activity of these cells in the techniques. So these here, shown in the rectangles, are, are these neurons that are shown here in the picture that release either kinin or versicon. 
what you're going to see is the kinin cells become active first, and the bursicon cells become active second. So here the, the kinin cells and the bursicon cells in the red square.
you remove the signaling and show that the insect can't survive, we may have antagonists, we may have a new way to uh, manage insect populations. I thank uh, the people that have been involved in this project over the years, uh, Dushan and his colleagues at the Slovak Academy of Sciences. Dushan's the person I mentioned that discovered the Inca cells originally. He actually named them after his wife, Ingrid. In Slovak, the nickname is Inca. An Inca cell in Slovak is Inca Bunka. It has a nice sound to it. And that's where the Inca cell came from. And uh, Young Jun Kim really got us playing with the imaging, Ko Cho with the gene expression, the steroid regulated gene expression. Doyan Kim, I mentioned, has been doing the work on Kine and Versicon. And Sonali uh, is a current grad student who's actually worked out some of the functions for ETH in, in the fly adult, which I didn't have time to talk about today. Vincent Park, who did the first work in Drosophila, and Giovanni Galizia, who is a guru for calcium imaging, who helped us get that started. And of course, we thank agencies that give us money. Well, thanks a lot for your attention, and I hope you learned something. Thank you. My question is physical rather than biochemical. Um, I'm wondering how before molting the insect has a fixed size exoskeleton. After molting, the insect that just has just molted out uh, develops an exoskeleton that's much larger in size. And it has there been an explanation how such a bigger thing can fit into a smaller container? Okay, so what happens actually is during the mold, the steroid surges, and shortly after that, uh, the steroid pulse, the epidermis make the cuticle separate from the existing cuticle. And actually the insect recycles the components of that old cuticle and, and, and recycles it into a newly synthesized cuticle. So it's making its new cuticle before it actually sheds its old coat. And in moth larvae at least, we know that the cuticle is secreted in folds so that once it escapes from the old cuticle, these folds can then stretch out and cover a bigger surface area than the one uh, before the mold started. Does that help understand how Yes, thank you. Sure. So, Mike, there are um, a lot of parasitic wasps that lay their eggs in uh, larvae. And uh, my understanding is that the parasitic wasps change the uh, developmental program of larvae so they, they fail to go through through ecdysis. Uh, so I guess my question is have you ever looked at whether uh, any of the parasitic wasps uh, inject uh, an inhibitor of uh, your, your ecdysis receptor uh, because that would seem to be at least a, a potential natural source for, uh, for inhibitors of that receptor. Yeah, so, so Toto's referring to parasitic Cetoid wasps that benefit from the insect development being arrested, and, and they do arrest development. Uh, they inhibit the mold, and, and through some mechanism, it seems that they're inhibiting the steroid pulse that initiates the mold. And uh, how that actually works isn't uh, known clearly. There are a number of labs working on it, um, but to my knowledge. Uh, a precise mechanism hasn't been worked out, but my impression is, in some way, the steroid metabolism is altered by, by the wasp venom. So the wasp injects um, a number of components. Most parasitoid wasps inject toxins that paralyze the insect, or at least uh, inhibit its locomotory activity, but they also co-inject hormones of their own that take over the host uh, endocrine system. Program in such a way that benefits the parasite. I don't, I don't 
there aren't, there's no clear chemical pathway that's been identified yet. Uh, just one last question. So, uh, knowing this, uh, what types of insecticides have been uh, designed uh, based on kind of uh, knowledge of the several layers of regulations on the football? Are there any uh, insecticides that are designed uh, to be environment friendly, to control uh, you know, populations, but at the same time not wipe them out from people? Right. There's, there's actually one group of, of insecticides that are bacterial products that have been identified as, um, no, they're not bacterial products, what are they called? Roman Haas came up with them. They're called dicenoids and they're bisacylhydrazines. And uh, in, just accidentally, they were, they were testing these compounds as herbicides and somebody noticed that insects feeding on the plants that were treated uh, were uh, showing signs of hemorrhaging, they, what they eventually uh, discovered was that these disacylhydrazine and disonoids were mimicking the steroid and initiating the mold prematurely. And what happens is when it's, a, when it's initiated prematurely, the cuticle isn't in the right state and the insects actually start bleeding and, and they die from, from this process. So, that's the only group of insecticides I know that have been shown to directly disrupt the mold, and they've been quite commercially successful. So from the point of view of steroid agonism, there, there is a group of insecticides, but there's nothing known that affects... Uh, oh, and the other group, of course, is, are the juvenoids, the juvenile hormone mimics. And they, when they're applied, they hang around and they're, they're in the insect system during the time the insect's normally going through metamorphosis, which requires low levels of juvenile hormones. So if juvenile hormone stays high, uh, the metamorphosis process is disrupted in, in the animal. Particularly uh, successful has been control of fleas, mosquitoes, and uh, cockroach because they're unable to complete metamorphosis. So that's a JH agonist. Similar mechanisms are found in the um, crustacean, in the you know, marine organisms. Yes, another Frank. This is related to the shrimp culture because for a time it's a big industry in the Philippines and uh, especially a particular species of shrimp, the Pineus monodon. And uh, at one point in time it was infected by a Baculovirus that infects the hepatopancreas. So, my question is that, like, uh, like uh, an effect on the hepatopancreas, for example, can have like a dramatic impact on the molting process of the crustacean because we notice that when the hepatopancreas is severely infected by these occlusion bodies of the baculovirus, and then the shrimp. Uh, molting cycle is like delayed and then you have like uh, um, suppressed growth, hardening of the shell. Um, is, uh, um, is this uh, somehow, uh, is there a link that you can correlate it with the uh, molting process in other organisms? I, uh, I do you know that the fat pancreas is the only tissue or organ system affected by these bacteriobiases? Is it, is it only the hepatic pancreas? I think. Um, I must say that my knowledge of, of molting is not all that complete in crustaceans. So I don't know of a link between the pancreas and the mold, but it sounds like there is one based on what you just told me. So maybe we could talk a little bit more afterwards.